Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felden. Okay, good to see everyone in once again, and <clears throat> want to welcome our television audience, wherever you are. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, again, we just like to let new listeners understand that we are just a Bible study. I'm not a pastor or I'm not a preacher. I'm not an evangelist. Uh, I always say I'm probably more like a Sunday school teacher. But uh, whatever, we like to open the Word and uh, we know the Lord is blessing it. And we're seeing uh, so many people that are uh, responding that uh, they're learning how to read their Bible and to study it on their own. Again, uh, for those of you who so often ask about materials, they'll have that at the end of the program. And uh, if you have any questions, you just call us on the 800 number. Okay, this is a Bible study, so we're going to pick right up where we left off. We're more or less going verse by verse for a while. And here we are in chapter 6 of Hebrews. And now we're going into verse 6. Now, I realize that sometimes this is kind of scary, but if you're a believer, this doesn't have to scare you one bit, because as we pointed out in our last program, there is a big difference between backsliding or failing as a believer and being an apostate. Now, we're going to look at that word more in depth as we go through this next half hour. So, verse 6 of Hebrews 6, that if they shall fall away. Now, maybe it should be better done if we start up there again at verse 4. <clears throat> For it is impossible to renew. Now drop down to 6. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance. But now remember, we've been looking at everything in between. That these folks can have this kind of knowledge. They can have the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. They certainly understood a lot of Old Testament truths. Now remember, we're talking about Jews who are hanging on to Judaism. All right, and so let's just start at verse 4 again. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. Now remember, watch the language. They didn't ingest it. They merely tasted. They were made partakers. They didn't actually have the Holy Spirit. They merely brought Him alongside. And then verse 5, they have tasted again the good word. Oh, they knew all about Christ's earthly ministry. They knew all the Old Testament promises and the powers of the world to come. We cover that in the closing moments of our last program, how that they understood this coming kingdom and all the glories of it. Now then, verse 6, if. Scary word, isn't it? If. They, these people who had this much understanding, if they shall fall away. Now, we're going to stop right there. This word that is translated fall away, and I put it on the board ahead of time, in the Greek is parapipto. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, and you don't have to be, but here is one instance, out of one instance where it pays to see the difference. This word is the only time it's used in the whole New Testament where it's translated in verse 6 that if they shall fall away. It is a parapipto. Whereas the other word that we're most familiar with, like in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that unless there is a falling away first, that term is apostasia. And it too is translated falling away. But it does not have the connotation that this one does. And I'm going to show you why. Because since it's the only time it's used in the Greek in our whole New Testament, even the Greek scholars have a hard time really nailing it down. But I, I went through enough. I found that one great Lindquist of days went by, said the only way you can understand this term, parapipto, is to realize what it meant in the Hebrew. And so the Hebrew word is mahal, M-A-H-A-L. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's mahal. And we're going to look and see what that word mahal really is talking about. And let's come all the way back to uh, 
I got to think for a minute. Clear back here in, uh, I think it's Leviticus, if I'm not mistaken. Numbers. Numbers. Exodus, Leviticus. No, I want to go ahead of that, don't I? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers. Boy, maybe I'm losing it. Maybe I'm losing it. But uh, I thought I had a reference back here someplace. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Numbers, chapter 5. Numbers, chapter 5. Drop down to verse 12. Now remember what we're showing, that this Hebrew word, mehal, is the best parallel with the Greek word, peripipto, which is only used in Hebrews chapter 6. And I'm taking the time to show the difference because I want you to see that this falling away in Hebrews chapter 6 is far worse than the normal term to fall away or to be apostasia. All right, you got Numbers chapter 5 and drop all the way down to verse 12. Well, verse 11. <clears throat> Numbers 5, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a, what's the word? Trespass. That's the Hebrew word, mehal. Now, if a wife turn aside and commit a trespass against her husband, and what does she do? She commits adultery with another man. Now, of course, we know adultery was common in Israel, just like this. But this is a unique situation from the word mehal. It is that when this woman literally turns her back with scorn on her husband. She doesn't just get caught in a moment of temptation and weakness, but she of her own volition with a scornful turning her back to her husband goes and commits adultery. That's the word mehal, translated trespass. All right, we got almost the same word, only used three or four times even in the Hebrew. And the next one is in Ezekiel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, chapter 14. Verse 13. Ezekiel 14. But we'll start with verse 12. Same Hebrew word. Y'all got it? Verse 12 of Ezekiel 14. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing, Mahal, grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Is that the term used with backsliding that we looked at in the last program? No. Backsliding would bring in God's mercy and grace. But this scornful turning the back is an apostasy or a parapiptal that is so scornful in its act that God has nothing left but judgment. He can't deal with it in mercy and grace. Now, see, that's what makes the difference then. All right, flip all the way back to Hebrews chapter 6. And this is what makes the difference, I think, in these verses in Hebrews that so many people have got all confused and are shook up about. This is not the common, ordinary believer who has suddenly fallen into sin, and he's not lost. He hasn't scornfully rejected the things of God. He's, been, he's just simply been human, and he has been caught in a moment of weakness, and he falls, like we saw in our last program. The man in, in Corinth, 
and he was restored. He was forgiven, see? But these people made a scornful turning the back on these things that God had revealed to them. Now then, since this is a much different situation of apostatizing, look what the result will be. If they shall fall away, or if they shall turn their backs scornfully on these things that are now revealed to them, they shall not be able to renew again unto repentance. It's impossible seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. All right, now what are we dealing with? We're dealing with people who have claimed to be believers. Now I'm going to keep it in the Hebrew element first and then we'll jump up to where we are today. Even these Hebrews to whom Paul is now writing have made a semblance of believing. They have gone along with all these things. But then when they really were pressed to make a decision to move on forward, what did they scornfully do? They went back under the law. They went back under the law. And there was no more of God dealing with them. Now I know, I have taught and I will continue to teach that God never gives up on a lost person. But it would seem to indicate that someone who has made a profession of faith without really becoming a believer, and then at one point in time they scornfully, like the ones we've looked at, Saul, King Saul, what did he do? He just scornfully went his own way. What was his end? Suicide. Judas, three years he trafficked along with Jesus and the eleven. The perfect hypocrite. But in the final analysis, when it was time to really show his colors, what did he do? He scorned the Lord and went and sold him for 30 pieces of silver and ends up committing suicide. I think we probably have the same thing with Demas that Paul dealt with. Boy, he went along with Paul, worked with him. But yet, as he said later on in Timothy, he forsook Paul, he forsook the gospel because he loved the things of this world. Now, we don't know that Demas ended up committing suicide, but it wouldn't surprise me because this is the end of these people who scornfully reject the enlightenment that they have received. And now reading on in verse 6, not only do they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, they put him to an open shame. Now stop and think. Does the, does the man of the world, well, let's just use the mafia for example. He lives a life of crime. He lives a life that is anything, anything but godly and Christian. Can he bring any reproach to the name of Christ? No. Nobody associates him with Christ. He'd be the last one that someone say, well, boy, I just, I just don't know what to think. That guy is supposed to be like Christ. No, that's never the idea. But you take these people who have taken on a semblance of being like Christ. Now, what does the world say? Hey, he claims to be a Christian and look, you remember the one I gave you, the, wife, the lady called and said, what about my preacher? He ran off with his secretary and left his wife and kids. Well, what is that man doing? He is throwing reproach on the name of Christ because at one time he claimed to know him. Now that's the difference. But you take the ungodly person out there who has never had any concern about spiritual, they don't bring a bad reflection. They've never had anything to do with Christ. And that's exactly what this verse is saying. But these people who claim to have tasted and they were enlightened and they had a knowledge of Scripture and then they scornfully turn and go back to where they come from, they bring nothing but reproach upon the name of Christ. And that's why I think God has to deal with it so, uh, what shall I say, so drastically and they put the name of Christ to an open shame. 
All right, let's just move on. I think I've covered that sufficiently. Now, always remember that this word falling away in Hebrews 6 is a far stronger act on the person's behalf than the word apostasia that we see in 2 Thessalonians 2 where it says that unless there is a falling away before the Antichrist would come. Okay, I don't think we've belabored that enough. Now, let's go to verse 7. For the earth... Now, we're still talking about these same kind of people, these same people who have been enlightened. They have a knowledge of Scripture, and they have turned their back, and they have put Christ to an open shame. All right, now the analogy is in verse 7, for the earth, an everyday experience in nature now, the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessings from God. Now there's just another earthly illustration again of the believer. The believer is just like tilled land. And that tilled land is kept free of weeds so that it can produce. Now, I think you're all close enough to agriculture out here in the Middle East. If our wheat farmers out here west of Oklahoma City would just let their land go and just let the weeds take over, they could drill in wheat till kingdom come. Would they get a crop? No. No. Why? Because the weeds are going to choke it out and the, the, the wheat would never survive. But instead, you can always tell a, a good farmer, a good husbandman, when you drive by his crops in the summertime, as to how much weeds it has in it. And if it's loaded with weeds and the crop is still in between there, well, you can just rest assured he's not exactly the best farmer in the community. Because you go down the road a little ways and you'll see a crop that is just as pure gold and beautiful. You know, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, uh, since we left uh, crop farming up in Iowa some 26 years ago, a lot of technology has come over agriculture, and now Iris and I are just a gas as we drive up through the Midwest and on our way out to Ohio and Indiana at these beautiful soybean fields. Now, when she and I were farming, it was a constant battle. We, by hand, would go out and hoe out the large weeds that would come up in our soybeans, the sunflower and so forth. I mean, I'll never forget, she says, is this going to increase our production or is this all cosmetic? Well, you know, it was mostly cosmetic. And I remember one hot day, she just threw down her hoe and went home. <laughs> if it's not going to increase production and it's cosmetic, why should I be doing it? But you see, this is, this is what the Bible is teaching us. That the farmer who is a good husbandman is going to control those weeds. Well, getting back to what I was going to say, these soybean fields now are just totally weed-free. Mile after mile. Now, I know some of you people watching me out on the East Coast, you go through the Midwest and you think, what's more boring than going by all those miles of corn and soybeans? Listen, there's nothing more beautiful. Not a weed to be seen. Those soybean fields are just like velvet for miles on end. Well, you know what has happened? The technology has now come that they can actually uh, maneuver the genes so that these soybeans are not killed with Roundup. Amazing! And so they put in Roundup ready soybean seed and they just let the soybeans come up and they may get pretty weedy. And then about the middle of June, that's what they tell me now, this is all after I've left it, now the middle of June they come in with Roundup and Roundup kills everything but the soybeans. And so here you now have these beautiful weed-free fields. Well, you see, that's what the Scripture says. That if you take care of your crop and you keep the weeds out, the rain is going to bring you a crop. Hundredfold, Jesus spoke of in John's Gospel. All right? And so it's the blessing of God. But what's the first word of verse 8? But. See? There's always a flip side. And what's the flip side? If you don't have a field that's been taken care of with good husbandry and you let the weeds come in, now look what happens. That which beareth thorns and briars is what? 
rejected. Who wants a field full of briars? Who wants a field full of cockaburs and thistles? Well, you see, the analogy is the same way in the spiritual. Now the true believer, the true believer is going to keep the weeds out. He's going to keep his life a testimony that the world can look at and say, I see Christ in that person. And that's what God expects of every one of us. Now that doesn't mean, you know, I've used the expression over and over over the years. God doesn't expect us to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. That's not what God expects. But God does expect that every moment of our life, our priorities are centered first and foremost upon Him and His Word. Now there again, that doesn't mean that every time you talk to somebody, you preach at them. I don't take that approach. But you know what it does mean? That every time somebody gives you an opening, somebody asks you a question, what should you be ready to do? Show them from the Scripture. Don't get a denominational paper. That may not always be right, but this one is. And so show them from the Scripture. See, that's what he was talking about up there in chapter 5. He said, you should be ready to teach others also. But you're not. You're still on the milk bottle. And so this is why I teach. Oh, that we can get people to get such an understanding of Scripture. I gave a couple illustrations in our last taping of men that had called. How that people came into their office and just with a question and they just took out a piece of paper and drew the timeline. And get people to understand how all these things have unfolded. Bringing us to this age of grace and this tremendous gospel. How that Christ died and rose from the dead. And by believing it, God will move in and transform us. All right, our time is going fast again. I don't want to run out like I did in the last program. Now continue on. But those that bear thorns and briars are rejected and is nigh unto cursing. Why? Because those briars and weeds are so awful. Have you ever gotten caught in a briar patch? Have you, Andy? I mean, you get halfway in and you don't know whether to go back out the way you come or keep going. It's no fun. And you hate them. I will never forget the first time I got to Oklahoma and went out on the ranch to fix fence or something. That's what happened to me. I got caught in one of those green briars and I didn't like Oklahoma. But I've learned to live with it. But all right, the Bible is telling us the same thing. A person's life who is filled with briars and weeds almost brings people to the place of cursing, see? And whose end is to be what? Burned. Well, now that's always the in indication in Scripture. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians. Hope I've got time. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now this, of course, is coming back into Paul dealing with us Gentiles, but it's the same God. And uh, the same God that inspired Paul to write to the Hebrews inspired Paul to write all his other epistles. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's start at verse 12, honey. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. And now Paul is dealing here with believers and they're working for reward during their Christian life. Now we're not dealing with any but believers. And remember, Corinthians had a lot of carnal believers. They were not spiritual. And so here's the illustration. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, which is Jesus Christ, he is the foundation of our faith, and from that we build. All right, and now on that foundation we can build gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Three materials that fire cannot touch, three materials that fire will put away in a, in a puff. All right? Verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest. One day it's going to come up before the Bema seat. Not for salvation, that's done, but for reward. And so every man's work shall be made manifest for the day, the judgment day, shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by what? Fire. And the fire shall try or test 
every man's work of what sort it is. Now remember what we're looking at. Gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. The first three, fire will do nothing but purify. The next three, it's going to disappear. All right, and so the fire will test every man's work of what sort it is. Now look at verse 14. If any man's work abide, it's gold, silver, and precious stones, he shall receive a reward. Now, verse 15, the carnal believer who has never really gotten into any service for the Lord, he's a believer, he'll be in glory. Now, if any man's work, uh, verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, it's wood, hay, and stubble, he shall suffer loss. But he shall be saved. He's going to make it, but he's not going to have any reward. You see that? So he shall be saved, yet as by fire. All right, now then come back to Hebrews, and we've got the same analogy. In fact, the Lord uses the same thing in John's Gospel, that branches that don't produce are going to be cast off and burned. They're useless. All right, but now here in Hebrews, we're talking about people who are not just carnal believers, they're apostates. They have scornfully turned their back on the truth of what God has offered. All right? And so it is rejected nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned or cast aside as worthless. That's strong language. Now, let's also look at the eternal state. It too is fire. Come back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. Got to hurry. Only got one minute left. Boy, these last minutes always go so fast. I look up there and I see four minutes left, and I think, I'm not going to be able to fill the whole time. And then all of a sudden it's gone. All right, Revelation chapter 20, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in. Now, this is the great white throne, remember. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their work. No believers at the great white throne. None. This is only for the unbeliever. And death and hell were cast into what? The lake of fire. Fire is always the term of judgment in Scripture. And so the lost of all the ages will finally end up in the lake of fire. This is the sudden second death. And then verse 15, Whoever was not found in the book of life was cast, where? Into the lake of fire. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.